guys, my name is Mike Patey. We are gonna combine Red Bull, Dubai, this hotel, and a one-of-a-kind airplane to land here. <laughs> are you kidding me? Back to work. It's physics, math, and engineering. Machine it, draft it, build it, test it, break it. Every time something new gets built, the entire world advances. Laying in bed at night, it's designing new parts, designing new suspension, designing new wings. Hey guys, look what Cup Crafters just dropped off. A carbon cup. It's absolutely awesome the way it is, but they asked me to play with it a little bit for something really exciting. So we're gonna change a few parts out for titanium. Strip off part of the fabric, lighten it up, do some special things with the fuel, add a little more horsepower to it. We're gonna see if we can squeeze just a little bit more out of this plane, make it a little more specific to a really cool event in Dubai. And so we're gonna dive into it, tear it apart. Let's see what we can do with a already amazing Cub Crafters Carbon Cub and get it ready for something awesome. So stay tuned, you know what we gotta do. Back to work. All right, guys, this is the very early stages of a exoskeleton impact zone for this aircraft. We're doing something extra fun with this airplane, a unique attempt, but because of what we're doing, there is a chance that if the landing was missed just a little bit, the tail of the aircraft wouldn't hit ground. It would hit the edge hard into this part of the plane. And so we want a crumple zone basically a front bumper to a car. You can hit it, it can crunch it, and it will protect the frame to an extent. If we just grazed it, this is designed, I'll have a big V bottom made out of honeycomb. It's designed to crunch the carbon fiber and collapse and just protect the inner tubes from getting a kink and then destroying the frame and having to try and repair it at the location or helicopter it out. This won't be a guarantee. If this got hit hard enough on a point, it will collapse the frame. But we will build a exoskeleton frame, removable carbon fiber impact zone. And if you just glanced it or hit it part way, it should just crunch and protect the main frame of the aircraft so the aircraft can still fly away. So. This kind of looks messy and ugly right now, but it's gonna look cool when we're done and it will be removable on and off for just about six feet of the back end of the aircraft. Hopefully we don't need it, but we're gonna make it just in case, make sure the plane can fly away safe. You guys know our drill, back to work. got the carbon fiber laid up around all the main structure of the carbon cub at the back end. Now we want to make some honeycomb ribs that come off of it. So we're going to bond together several of these and make a multi-layer rib that will get bonded to the spine down the middle. But then to get the added strength of picking up additional structure of the plane and further distributing the load if this were to happen to get impacted we'll end up making some V's coming off of the honeycomb and tying into the outside edge. Then we'll put some big micro fillets in with carbon fiber wraps on the edges. And then we're gonna bag the whole thing together tight and make basically a multi-layer honeycomb impact protection zone down the middle. The triangulation is gonna help hold that middle safe. And if it does crush, it distributes the load the carbon fiber that's along the belly of the plane won't let that triangle want to move outward. And so we're gonna just, making a triangle just makes a really strong impact zone. I'm just gonna make a portion of the center rib real quick, bond a couple of these layers together, then we'll start making the triangles, all the rest. A lot of talking. Back to work. All right, guys, so what I did now is I have three pieces. I overlapped the joints, of course, to make it stronger. 
Then I put a piece of carbon fiber between them and then I filled all of the ends of the honeycomb solid with the resin where the two butt together. This is just the center rib. I'm gonna go ahead and pull this all off now. I clico this to the table to get a nice straight edge. Now I've got to pull it off. I've got my peel ply and my vacuum bag. We'll put that over the peel ply, then we'll put on some foam, then the vacuum bag, and then we'll suck this down to the table and vacuum it directly to the table. That will push all the resin out as much as possible out from inside. Keep it light, but make it really strong and make this one thick, strong part to be the beginning point of our belly bumper. So back to work. guys we're finishing our belly bumper this is the next phase we got these triangle parts they're going to make a triangulated gusset that runs the full length of our little bumper impact we are also going to embed a solid fiberglass stranded rod that goes right down the belly so if you were to bounce off our belly bumper that first impact point will be a solid fiberglass rod that can help distribute the load through the multi layers of honeycomb we've got going vertical and then also through these 45 degree braces that go out to the outer frame. So we're trying to distribute the load all the way across and hopefully not even damage this. And if we do just crunch that little area, have the plane still safe to fly. So let's get these installed. We have a lot to do, back to work. Dust off after I take off my mask. <laughs> All right, guys. Uh, we just finished one of the hardest parts of any aircraft project is making molds where you turn 10, 15 pounds of Bondo and random pieces into dust and then lay it up with carbon fiber so you can then bag a part off it. So I am done with sanding. Time to do some carbon fiber, finish this mold out. We have a lot more to do. Sun doesn't come up for a couple more hours, so 20 plus hours and counting, back to work. Okay guys, this part is officially done other than fine tune, trim off the excess carbon that's running long and sand it and then just put a light clear coat on it. I did something different on this and I don't know if you'll be able to see it in the time lapse, but once the structure was done, I knew I wanted this to just be a raw carbon part and I didn't want any seams or folds or anything. So I spent a little more time to get those last two dressing and structural layers over it without any cuts or seams. Everything takes a little more work to stretch it and work it. I also wanted to eliminate any pinholes. Anybody who has painted carbon fiber knows the nightmare I'm talking about. Carbon fiber and fiberglass, but specifically carbon with a thick weave. Everywhere they cross over, it makes a little pinhole. And when you go to clear coat it, the clear coat wants to leave those pinholes and just keep layering up. And it just, it's like you gotta spray it, sand it, spray it, sand it, and you chase them forever. On this, I took care of that hassle by once I put the two carbon final layers on, I used a spreader and I pulled all the resin out possible to just get all the weight out of it. So I squeegeed it out really tight so that the two layers and the base layer, I pulled the resin out and that gives me my structure. Less resin, more strength, less weight. However, after I squeegeed all the resin out and got it dressed up the way I want, I put a little more resin just on the outside and brushed it over the whole thing and then squeegeed it nice and smooth and then put this peel ply layer on. Now, if you've done carbon fiber and you've laid down peel ply, this is gonna look a little different unless you've used this trick before. Um, you're not seeing millions of pinholes in this. By putting that last little layer of carbon fiber resin 
over the top. Why I specifically say over the top, we don't want it in the carbon fiber. So we squeegeed it out tight first to get the weight out, get the structure in. Now this is acting like doing a clear coat on the top, but I'm doing it with the resin and then the pill ply to hold it. And you can see, I don't have a single pinhole in this whole part, which is kind of hard to do. So I'm pretty proud of this one. And I've got this all pulled down. And now when this dries, I can pull the pill ply, lightly sand it, and this will be done. And if I do put one final clear coat on this, which I will, I won't have millions of pinholes that I need to chase with layer and layer and layer of clear coat, which actually makes the part heavy again. This is a lighter way to go, much less work and a better finished product. So we'll see how it turns out, but I'm really happy that went really well. No seams, no joints, no cuts, multiple compound corners. I'm super happy. <laughs> the sun is gonna sneak out any second, so we're gonna call it a morning or night. Hit it again tomorrow, back to work. This is the most oddly satisfying, best part of making a carbon fiber part is getting to peel it off and trim it up. Let's see how this goes. Gotta watch out for the sharp edges because the edge of carbon fiber is like razor blades and a million needles. Almost perfect. Got a couple little filler spots, but right now this has got a really thick layer of carbon fiber resin on the outside. And so now I can actually sand and then wet sand this down to perfection and uh, then buff it out and be finished with it. So back to cutting, trimming, sanding, <laughs> back to work. All right guys, so there's a couple of tiny little pinholes for the most part, there's none. And that was the extra layer of resin I put on the top. I'm sanding it out and the, the worst one's already come out. So the other, just one big one, a couple little itty bitty ones, they're gonna come out for sure. So as long as I don't get aggressive and sand through the carbon, I did put two layers of decorative carbon over the top. So I got a little buffer. I can tell right now, I'll be able to sand this down. I do wanna take off all the extra resin possible. You can kind of see the difference um, when you're sanding, when you hit and touch the edge of the carbon. And so I stop there. So I'm gonna take off all the excess resin, stop at the carbon, and then I can buff this out and we'll be done. So a few more hours, back to work. Now that we've got this almost done, a few more layers of sanding, I want to kind of talk about how it's engineered to take an impact. On a cub, you have cross braces going through really lightweight chromoly tubes. Any of those tubes by themselves have almost no strength for an impact. If you point loaded, like landing short and hit the edge of the tail of a plane, other than hitting right in the V of those tubes on a, on a cub frame, Anywhere else, it's just going to crater in and fold the tail and completely destroy its integrity. The idea here is to distribute the load evenly across several of the webs and between one side tube running to the front and another one running to the front. And then designing it so that the impact doesn't send a point load anywhere, it distributes outward. And so the way we've done that is the bottom of this is several layers of really thick carbon coming across the bottom. It's got honeycomb making the TP in the middle and in the top we have a solid fiberglass rod running the length of it right here. That rod is to absorb the blunt impact and disperse it through the honeycomb downward but that honeycomb if it didn't have the carbon fiber on the bottom would instantly just collapse. It would spread outward. But since we've locked the bottom, the impact load hits the top, tries to spread, but it can't, and it distributes down the length of the beam we've made. So 
This actually has another member that goes straight down. So we've made a pyramid with a web down the middle and then wrapped it and then grabbed around the side so that we can anchor it to the tube. So this really will take a huge impact. You could hit it hard enough, obviously, to break it. It's like the bumper of a car. We can hit it, we can bounce off it, we can make light impacts. At some point it could fail, but the likelihood is we could hit this, bounce the tail back up and hit the brakes and stop and not have a plane stranded on the top of a building in Dubai, wondering how we're gonna get it down and then how to strip it, rip the fabric and rebuild the whole thing because structurally it would be toast. So may we never use our cub bumper. However, if we do use it and it gets us safely up without destroying the back half of the plane, then all this work and time is absolutely worth it. So I don't know, we'll see, cross our fingers. Let's get it installed, back to work. All right, guys, we just got a trial fit panel. Uh, David from Avionic Systems and myself made this new layout design and then he laser cut it and sent it to me. So I suspect it'll work perfect the first time because he does a really good job. And the two of us draw it up on the computer together and come out with the layout. But the idea here now is to strip out a bunch more weight and further upgrade this aircraft for the events we're gonna put this through all over the country and around the world. So let's pull some weight out. So right off the bat, what's currently has been in there is an older Dynon system. And uh, Garmin has got so much integrated now, we can remove a couple of screens that were in there integrate it all into one Garmin G3X Touch. This is a different style uh, Garmin radio. It has US frequencies, but it also has the frequencies for other countries. So I have to have a kind of a special radio that goes here. I also did something kind of fun. Um, we lined up all the primary switches that you use the most often and are more likely the ones that tend to pop breakers like landing lights, big amp draw systems. We put all the switches that operate all those systems and we put the breaker directly above it. It's oftentimes you'll have so many breakers in one place, it's like hunting through a little fine print list. This will be quick for all the primaries, like your alternator has a big amp load and that breaker could trip. So we're lining up the master and all the primary switches in a row in the order you would like to start the aircraft and shut down in reverse. So it's a flow series layout, correlating breakers above them, and then the secondary breakers over here, there's not so many, it'll be easier to quickly pick through them. Of course, we have our smoke system and our nitrous systems up here in the top, made symmetrical. So this should save a ton of weight. I'm super excited to trial fit it. So we're gonna put it in right now. And if it's good, we gotta cut the whole inside of the plane out, rip out a bunch of that older stuff, knock off a bunch of weight. You guys know what we gotta do. <laughs> Back to work. All right, guys, we are here working on the most awesome Red Bull project for this crazy trip to Dubai. I cannot wait. I'm fortunate enough to have David Buckwalder out here from Avionic Systems. Again, David helped me out with Scrappy and with some other past builds, including Draco and Turbulence. <laughs> Just go back in time. We've been hanging out way too long. And 36XX. And the Beast 36XS. Absolutely. So David has done panels for me for... I don't even want to admit how long we both had more hair and it was less <laughs> white. He came out, he's from the East Coast. Um, if you guys want or need a panel, check out Avionic Systems. Seriously, one of the greatest guys, become a true friend over the years in aviation. And uh, let him help you out with your experimental aircraft. He is an absolute wizard at it. On this airplane, we wanted to lighten it up for this experience. And fortunately, Garmin did something awesome for us. They packaged everything up so well and got it so light. Everything is mounted to the back of the unit. It's lightweight. You guys see Garmin and all my stuff. There's a reason for it. They're absolutely the best in my opinion. But even with this one screen, this plane used to have a Dynon and a few other screens um, kind of spread out and filled the panel a little more. I've got more functions and features in this panel than the panel we pulled out. And how much weight do you think we pulled out of it? A lot, yeah. It was a lot of multiple units that came out. It's all gonna be done by just a few uh, from Garmin. 
Yeah, so we stripped the weight out. That was the goal. It's going to look awesome. Some of the features we'll show you in a little more close up. We've got a nitrous system that's set up with an easy arm. So it, in safe mode, it will never do anything. If you arm it, it will put a big bright light on the dash. It's a warning that says, hey, the nitrous is armed, but it won't do anything until throttle hits full throttle and hits the bump stop. It won't allow you to hit nitrous without the throttle being full throttle because that's a lot of risk on the motor if you're not revved up, ready to receive the nitrous. I do have a purge button built in, but this is the nitrous side. This side is a smoke kit side. Everything's fully integrated here. We got a radio. We had to get a different radio because we're going to Dubai. Have to make sure we get, was it the 0.33? 0.33. 0.33. Mm -hmm. um, in it so that we can use it overseas. Typically, Ron and I live in the airplane and we feed everything throughout the whole airplane. Mm -hmm. Hook up autopilots, autopilot servos, and we just get to bring a big giant mess little organized mess to the back of the panel. Dave comes out and ties it all into a beautiful panel he did. So anyway, the plane's going great. We shredded a lot of weight. You can even see now the wing tops are put back on. We finished that fabric up just last week. The back where the baggage door is gone. You can see the fuel mech sticking out the top for the ram air to the fuel system. We had to add fuel pumps on here, which is normally it's gravity fed because the tank is lower then the engine now, so it does have to have positive pressure. So we did two redundant pumps, both check valve to each other and with redundant fuel pressure systems. And we were able to share the same fuel pumps for the nitrous fuel pressure, even though they're totally different PSI. So lots of little features. We took the fuel pressure at a higher rate, then put two step down regulators, one to run a carburetor, one to run the nitrous, and then they two feed to a single feed line the reason for that is both pumps run all the time and both pumps are running a main feed that then step to step down regulators and probably talking way too much but what it does is make sure that whether the engine needs it the nitrous needs it both obviously need it when you turn on the nitrous you will never have a situation where you have a pump failure cause a problem with the engine because you have a backup already running in standby so um, that's how we did that to kind of take the fuel tanks out of the wing. And the, really the reason for that is simply the mass moment so high over your head from the pivot point of the gear when you hit the brakes, sends planes over. And when you get a lot of fuel way up high and you hit the brake, that is one of the largest mass moments that puts you over the top. And if we're gonna be stopping a plane on a little teeny tiny spot on the edge of a large drop off of one of the most beautiful buildings in the world from the helicopter pad, we need to hit the brakes hard. So we're putting all the weight down low in the back, moving the CG aft and the mass moment to the bottom. So, hey, that's a lot of talking. We have a lot of work to do. Dave, we're gonna make you work. We're gonna go sand on the back, make some carbon fiber parts. Let's do it. You know the drill, back to work. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Dex, what are we doing? All right, so we're wrapping the elevator on the small company's plane. <laughs> this, <laughs> this little baby startup company right here. Support the startup. <laughs> awesome. So how's it going? It's going great. Just barely finished up trimming the bottom half. I got a little bit more trimming in between the two. Pretty much we thought we'd give it a quick explanation with lapping the two sides because we got to take two pieces and sandwich them. So you have to overlap them without peeling. Now, when you're doing most wraps, it'll only be about a 16th to an eighth of an inch taking the two pieces. But because we're exposing this to a ton amount of wind and you know, you're over hundred miles an hour for extended amounts of time, I decided to overlap it 75% of the weight over the bend here and then over that way. So when the wind hits the surface on these fronts, it's always pushing the vinyl down and you don't have any chance of peeling. Now we were going to show the best part. We tried to take a video of us peeling all of this off, super satisfying. <laughs> and turns out the video was a picture. So. <laughs> that was, that was this dumb old man right here holding the camera's fault. <laughs> I said, okay, go ahead. And he did this beautiful, oddly satisfying peeling up the edge. And uh, I wasn't recording, but you guys, I'm really proud of my son. I've never seen someone that can freehand. I don't know if this camera is going to do it justice. Check out this free-handed joint. He can cut the straightest line you've ever seen. And uh, he's like a skilled 
pro surgeon. So Dak's way to go. Looks beautiful. I'm gonna stop talking. Get back to work. <laughs>